morning, everyone. Whoa, that was touch and go, wasn't it? <laughs> we are constantly getting updates on Zoom, which is causing huge problems in us getting live. But we did it. Good old uh, ADHD crisis brain. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, as you know, I have um, a similar brain, but my brain is like full of fear when I'm late to anything. Uh, so you can just see like, it's worse, isn't it? When you see the clock ticking yeah. and trying to do what you want to do. Oh, my gosh. Panic. But we're here. We're here, Chrissa. We're we'll here. Overcome mountains and rivers to get here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> in the technological sense anyway um morning everyone i can see there's lots of people watching so that's really really good and uh yeah panic over you can see us now <laughs> we nearly didn't make it um i'm chrissa for those who don't know me and i'm joined by my wonderful colleague kelly this morning, morning. we've we got plenty to say this morning haven't we Cal? yeah we do i think we're, we're we're simultaneously people's worst nightmare and greatest dream when we get together because we don't shut up <laughs> so um i hope you all manage to keep up um first thing first thing on a tuesday morning where i, I mean many of you will be doing the whole back to school thing um if there if there's been sort of inset days or anything so anyone who's having a really really tough morning we're here with you we know what it's like oh yes yeah Absolutely. stay strong Absolutely. And I think, you know, we've got the whole, <laughs> we've got quite a lot to cover this morning. Um, and we've not got any particular strict uh, list to go through. We've got some notes that we need to sort of uh, be mindful of because I know where we go off in a tangent. But we've got the whole Bridget Philipson song oh. that we've both commented on. So do check out our Instagrams because we've got plenty to say about that. Um, and then there's, you know, school avoidance, um, you know, and then everything else. And I think as somebody who struggled with school attendance myself in uh, towards the end of my education, and I've got uh, one particular child who was out of school for nearly, well, nearly two years, actually, and then ended up at Kelly's school. That's how we got to know each other. Um, and then I have one with very early stages of school, let's call it reluctance at the moment. And we're working really hard on that. So I'm hoping it doesn't go any further. So plenty of experience. Also, of course, Kelly is a head teacher or was a head teacher who would scoop these kids up, wouldn't you? You know, these, yeah. these are the kids. Absolutely that. And I think one of the things that I'm most passionate about in this role is about sort of upskilling schools and trying to help change hearts and minds and thought processes about what attendance is and why attendance happens, what learning is and where learning does or doesn't need to happen. And, and actually, you know, trying to be, I always say this, but trying to be cycle breakers, particularly for those children who have just been used to one way and that's the only way. And then when you don't conform to that way, it then becomes a you problem. But it's actually not a you problem. It's a box problem. The, the box is the wrong shape. It's not you. So um, I'm, I'm so fortunate to do this role because in helping parents, I then get into a lot of schools. And I, I, I've i just been blown away by some amazing schools recently oh. and how open they are to thinking about things in a different way. But equally, there are schools out there who are alarmingly rigid. Um, and you just think, you know, what's the point? Like, are you trying to save face? Like, because if you let me help you, you know, I could potentially get your school quite a bit more funding for this child or, yeah. you know, we can do things a bit differently. But, you know, it, it is what it is. This is why we do what we do. Um, yeah. and, you know, helping just one family, let alone how, how many we help is worth it. You know, every bit. Oh, absolutely. And and the thing is, you look at the socials and the inquiries we've got at the moment, and we are absolutely inundated, as we always are at this time of the year. We always take August to kind of go, ah, and then September's like, woo! Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but the concerns, you know, they're coming in thick and fast. And this is why we always plan these Facebook Lives on this topic at this time, because we know so many of you, we, we can't get to you quickly enough. Um. So I can see there's lots of people watching. Um, I won't say hello to everybody because I'll be here forever. And I know everybody wants the answers. And, I, you know, just to sort of prepare you and set some expectations. We've got lots of things we're going to discuss this morning. What we don't have is a magic wand. <laughs> we would love that. But 
what we might have is a nugget of information that helps a teacher or a parent really change something for a child or group of kids or entire schools, who knows? Um, but there, like I said, there are so many concerns. I've seen t people talking about school avoidance, of course, like I've already said. Um, and I think that is something for some kids is new. And for other kids, it's spilled over from last year. And, you know, September's just not happening for them. Um, sensory issues, anxiety, uniform issues, trauma. You know, we need to still remember COVID wasn't that long ago. Our kids lived through something we didn't live through. That didn't happen for us. And so... I don't think we're paying enough attention to that. I saw a lovely post this morning from a friend of mine. I, I don't know whether she'll be watching because she doesn't have any send kids, but one of her children is starting school now, September. And so she was born in COVID. And Kelly, like, you know, you remember this for yourself, having pregnancies, doing a really tricky time and raising little children in this really tricky time. Those kids are going to experience something very different to what we're used to, aren't they? Absolutely. And I think the thing with COVID and children in COVID is that um, it can be thrown around as quite a flippant thing. Mm. So when I'm doing, say, EHC needs assessment request letters, because that's one of the things that I do very often at Sunshine, I, I, I will talk to a parent about what their child's needs are, produce a really, really good, long 12 page, 13 page yeah. letter and goes off to the local authority to ask for needs assessment. Um, one of the things that I do, I, I see coming back sometimes is um, oh, your child's struggling because they missed school because of COVID, because they've got gaps in their learning because of what happened in COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that's missing the point. That's not to say that COVID is a really big impact, but it is. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily to do with, oh, they weren't there because of COVID and that's why they're struggling. It's more to do with the fact, imagine if your whole life is about masking, right? Mm -hmm. And this is true for so many of our kids with SEND. You mask, you mask, you mask to fit in. And then all of a sudden, you don't have to go to school for a big chunk of time. And you're not in that sensory overwhelm environment that you are fighting day in, day out to sort of suppress and keep keep within you. And then you find yourself, you know, in your safe space. You're learning in a real child directed way because, you know, you can learn sitting on a beanbag or on the floor or on a bed. Uh, you, you can learn, you know, your teacher said, do you do a PowerPoint on something that you're interested in? You're like, whoa, what's this? This is great. And you don't have to talk to people that stress you out or anything. So that mask comes off. Yeah. And when that mask has been off for how long were we in lockdown or out of schools for about eight months? Yeah. Um, you know, you it's hard to put that mask back on. Right. Yeah. So you go back into school and all of a sudden you realize I have to sit in a chair again. I have to do this again I have to walk in this way I have to play at these times I have to do that and then no wonder so many children with undiagnosed send or even diagnosed send completely fall apart when they go yeah. back to school. so it's not just about you know oh COVID did this and we weren't there it, it's about actually COVID allowed so many children to breathe and, and not mask and then we are in a new normal now education like think of how we work like after mm -hmm. COVID, we now, loads more people work yes. remotely or hybrid. Why isn't the same thought process being applied to schools? It's it's just bonkers. There's, there's this sort of obsession with control. We have to control the numbers. The numbers have to be in front of our face. The bums have to be on the seats. But actually, what we're not focusing on is the important bit, which is the learning. And I just made a note there when you were talking about think about something that you enjoy that you that really sort of you you digest you you actually listen and absorb and learn something like um watching a film okay watching a film is an enjoyable experience and we learn something whether it's factual or not you are learning that new information about the story about the actors about the environment everything from that film is going into your brain would you go to the cinema and sit at a desk and not fidget for two hours to watch that film. No, you wouldn't, because you know that you're going to absorb that information and enjoy it if you're comfortable. Yeah. And I just don't get it how, I, I know that Ofsted have got this big sort of, I, I know things have changed in the last few days, but you know they've got this big ugly power over schools. Schools are trembling when Ofsted, we've yeah. seen it. You know, I've seen I've seen teachers say to kids, please be good tomorrow, you know, and they're crying because of the pressures placed on them. That is not where learning happens. And also, you know, teachers are dropping like flies as a result. Yeah. Um, 
But sort of another reason as well that I think a lot of parents are getting in touch with us are um, it always because provision hasn't been arranged yet. Um, I mean, one lady mentioned that either this morning or last night that her EHCP was finalised in May and the child starts in reception to this week and the school have just contacted her to say, we're just not ready. So this child can't start, which of course I've said, get in touch with us because we've got plenty to say on that. But like... Oh. It's just bonkers. It's bonkers. And I think some parents as well have already had the the sort of warning about attendance. Like, oh, we remember last term, you offender you. Um, and I think all of this makes it so anxiety inducing. And we know as well, because, of course, you are by trade a teacher. We've yeah. got Lindsay, who's a teacher, Gabby, who's a teacher, Kerry, who was a teacher. And of course, Emily, who was a, an assistant senko. All of you have come out of education for the same reason. And that's because it's just not aligned with your beliefs anymore. Yeah. But also, this isn't enjoyable. Like, who no. wants to go into that lion's den? The teachers don't want to be there. The kids don't want to be there. And actually, nobody's listening. Nobody's listening to those statistics. Yes, teachers are dropping like flies. Kids are not attending school. Uh, can we stop going, if you don't do it, you're going to get in trouble? It's not a legal requirement for children to be educated in a school building, is it? No. And Bridget, good old Bridget, coming out this week and saying that she is of the overwhelming belief that the best place for school, for children is in school. You know, it's just really disappointing. So I think there was a lot of hope when she was appointed and a lot of hope with the new government that, that things would that there would be a different flavour. Um, and now a lot of parents are sort of thinking, well, this is more draconian than I was expecting. Um, and, and we can't right, we can't ignore the fact that for some pupils, and I would even go to say the majority of pupils, school is the best place for them mm -hmm. on a day to day basis because yeah. they can cope. They're yeah. not they're neurotypical or they are OK with the sensory environment. They're OK with the way that the learning is delivered. It's a really social place. Some children who live in poverty, they need to go to school because that's where they get their main meal of the day. Main meal of the day, you know, uh, so that, you know, they can be looked after and cared. You know, we can't deny that for some children, 100 percent school's the right place to be. I loved school when I was a kid. I thrived on the routine. I loved rules. Actually, I don't like rules. That's the real truth. But I really liked the security that adhering to the rules gave me. Um, and I, I just loved school. I loved everything about it. Going every day was a treat for me. But I had friends who, for, for whom school was just the, the biggest trial you could ever imagine. And these weren't the sort of pupils you think of when you think about school avoiders or, or people who find it difficult to go to school. They were really, you know... As the as local authority like to remind us, bright and capable and, yeah. and things. And, and you should you should like school. You should go to school because you're bright. And that's the only pathway for you in life. School, university, blah, 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 blah. Um, it, it just we are living, like I said, in a different world. We're not applying what adults are learning to be their best ways of working to our children. And I did yeah. a reel about this the other day on my Instagram that that children grow into adults. Right. <laughs> like we don't suddenly just magically change when we become an adult no. neurodivergent children still need when they're adults the same sort of accommodations and changes that they needed when they were young it's just that it might look a bit different and um why aren't we doing that why aren't we applying like what what our workforces are now saying is the right way forward to our youngsters no actually we're going right youngsters you have to do this really rigid five days a week in this box doing this Oh, but then magically, when you become an adult, you don't have to do any of that anymore. Yeah. And you do a four-day working week. Or you can work in a hybrid, flexible way. We have flexi working, like we do at Sunshine. It's marvellous. We we organise our own diaries. I have two tiny children. One's just turned two. One is four in November. And I work weird hours, right? I work in the evening. I work in the morning. I work early, late, whatever. But the flexibility it gives me is great. Why are we churning out robots yeah. and squids just to just then go into that? It's just crazy. Yeah. The only thing that we're preparing our children to get used to is the broken education system. <laughs> and nobody wants to yeah. be a teacher for that reason. Um, it's really frustrating. And I think one of the things as well is I want to reassure parents because 
a lot of parents think, oh, God, this is just me and just my child. This has been going on for ages. This is not a new problem, right? Let's cast our minds back to when we were in school. We remember the kids who went for a cigarette behind the bike shed. That's a sensory <laughs> break, but it wasn't recorded. We didn't have the digital recording systems that they've got now. So the safeguarding wasn't as robust. And don't get me wrong. I'm not poo-pooing the new safeguarding systems. I think it's very, very, very important to keep children. Yeah. Safe. It's the utmost important thing that we do. However, what I'm saying is, you know, like a lot of people say, is there more crime now or are we just seeing it more because social media is literally feeding it to us? Yeah, it's probably that. It's probably that information is more readily accessible for us. So we think it's worse because we were sheltered from it before. And I think that's what it is with this we remember the kids used to bunk off right we all remember them I wasn't one I was like you Kelly I liked the teacher patting me on the head going you've done very well I yeah the dopamine boost from that I absolutely loved it um <clears throat> But some kids, not everybody is like that. So there were kids that bunked off. There were kids that went behind the bike sheds for whatever whatever it might have been that they there were, were going to go to school. There were kids who would just stay at home and learn to do things, yeah. learn to make a home, learn to a trade. And there wasn't that level of, right, you've got to get to school. Those kids were sort of slipped through the net. And it's interesting that you mentioned safeguarding because that's something that I really do feel passionately about. We shouldn't lose track of our children. We should know where our children are and what's happening to them. But this needs to happen in a way that meets families where they are and through a neuro neurodivergent lens. Because yeah. if you view neurodivergent families or families are a bit different, families are a bit quirky through a neurotypical lens, then all you're going to see is what you want to see. You're not yeah. going to see what's there. And that's a really important differentiation because it could actually end up being very discriminatory. So we need to make sure that children are safe and looked after and we know where they are. But we also need to accept that families do things in different ways and that yeah. learning has many, many forms. It does not need to look at like sitting behind a desk and doing work on paper with a pen. It, yeah. You know, that is just one of a thousand different ways we learn. Um, okay. And as educators, we are... We are duty bound to make sure that our children learn because learning is a right that all children should expect and learning can be fabulous. Oh. Learning is fabulous. Um, but as educators, we have the right to understand and be open and be really creative and innovative in how we cater for our whole cohort of children, including those who don't make it through the front door of our schools. Absolutely. And I think we, we've got to, like we always say, be curious, not judgmental. It's about widening the lens that you're looking through, isn't it? Yeah. And so it's going, OK, this family is different to my family. Let's be curious. Let's see if there's something, you know, I, I think that actually educators need to learn more <laughs> as in open their mind to be able to learn more about different ways of working, different neurotypes then you know a neurodivergent family goes about their family life in a very different way to a neurotypical family I don't actually know a neurotypical family there's always a bit of spice in there somewhere <laughs> um but when people say to me for instance what do you do differently with your DLD because one of my children has got um developmental language disorder and somebody said to me so what do you do that's so different I don't know it's completely ingrained in what I do. So I don't know how I meet her needs differently to a neurotypical child because it's just ingrained. But actually, if we sit and unpick it, I'd love to share my ideas about how I successfully keep her regulated and stop her from becoming dysregulated. And it's that, you know, be curious. You're going to learn so much about different ways of life. Um and why maybe school avoidance is happening. And I think that the harder as well, the government are coming down on school non-attendance, the worse it's getting. We're not seeing an improvement. Um, I know that there was a piece of research because we quote it in our webinar, the webinar that we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks. So if you guys enjoy this conversation, by the way, and you want to learn more about school avoidance, the legalities, the practicalities, the trauma, anxiety, all that kind of stuff. We have got a two hour dedicated webinar. Uh, it's the week commencing the 23rd of September during School Avoidance Awareness Week. 
Um, the team will put the links in the chat, but do come along to that because Kelly and I are presenting that one. Um, but there is a piece of research that we quote in there that shows that school fines and punishments work in the very, very short term because of the fear that they instill in families. In the long term, what they achieve is further school attendance difficulties, fractured families, broken relationships, a breakdown completely of a child's education. That's not what a teacher wants. That's not what a parent wants. When a teacher goes into education and they want to increase, improve school attendance, they're not thinking they want to break families. They want to ruin a child's learning. But that's what fines and punishments do. Mm. And I think a lot of the problems as well, you know, a lot of parents are coming to us saying it's the school, the school are saying that they have no choice. Ofsted are saying this. Ofsted, Ofsted aren't saying anything about that. They're not telling them specifically what to do. But the CEOs of the multi-academy trusts are. Yeah. So quite often it's not Ofsted. It's not the Department for Education. It's not the head teacher. It's who's feeding down to them. Yeah. And I, that's think, totally it. And I think and, and what what there's a misconception a lot of the time about Ofsted that Ofsted will come in and tell you what to do in your school they actually won't Ofsted mm. are there to test the judgments you make about your school so what Ofsted come and test is how well you know your school and the reasons behind the choices you've made in your school so if you're able to for example say that you have made particular choices about children who struggle to attend and this is what you're doing and you've got really robust safeguarding you've got really robust record keeping you you've got really you you can show that you've tried to do everything like education healthcare needs assessment requests and really good school support send support level stuff um if you can show all of that and then you say well actually we we made some quite quirky decisions about our children who struggle to attend and this is what those decisions are um yes we authorize them to go on holiday in term time why did you do that when they can't attend at all like what that's the point well actually that sends a message it shows that we understand that that you know they need they need that holiday mental health you know all those different reasons it might seem like a crazy decision but actually, if you've got the justification and the record keeping behind it, and the thing is that the, you're right, the CEOs of the mat, um, they don't want a lot of the time their, their individual heads having those conversations with Ofsted because they don't have the level of control that they want. So those CEOs aren't in those meetings with those heads. And unless you've got absolute confidence in your head to talk like that, then it's a scary thing for a mat mm. head. And where I was ahead, we weren't in a mat, but we were in a similar sort of arrangement where there were lots of schools owned by a, a sort of upper tier of management. And that mm -hmm. upper tier of management didn't come into schools for Ofsted. So we had to sort of manage those ourselves. And luckily, in my school, we were given the trust and, and confidence and ability to go, well, you've made these decisions, you own them and you talk about them. So it was all right. But um, again, we're going back to why it's a real struggle to be a teacher. You know, I loved teaching. I, I loved it. I love working with children. I, it's the one thing I really miss is the direct contact with young people. I really do miss my kids. Um, but if I lived my life again now and I was just going into teaching right now with things as they are now, I can't 100% say that I would do it. No, and I, I, so many people say the same thing. And one of my closest friends has been a teacher for, oh, this makes us sound really old, but like over 20 yeah. years. And she said, it's, it's, it's a different job. It's a yeah. completely different job to what she went into. And um, I think autonomy is stripped from teachers as well. And so I think that the purpose of what we're saying here um, to parents is also understand teachers are feeling quite anxious about the return to school because they don't have any control over anything. Oh, sir, so, what's happened to you? You're being really nice here. What am I nice doing here? I'm only joking. No, I know. Well, I, the thing is, this is what creates the balance. And let's like talk about that elephant in the room because I am the sort of like warrior parent, you know, gone to the high court, try, you know, the system tried to silence me, tried to take my children off me. This is why Sunshine Support exists because I cannot stand for it. And there are certain professions that I really I don't think I'll ever soften to because they really harmed my family. However, uh, I know the magic can't happen without teachers and parents working together, but I still have this fire in my belly that's very pro-parent, which is why we do this lovely balanced approach where you are 
the amazing teacher and I am the warrior parent and we try and balance that out but look at me softening this is crazy I know I love it (laughs) we've got some great comments by the way well I'm going to come to them in a minute because what I thought we'd do is because we've kind of gone off into sort of school avoidance school non-attendance we'd have predicted that shock horror um what I thought we'd do is if we go through some ideas um, that helps children with the return to school, helps the teacher, helps the parent, helps the child. And then what we can do after those uh, recommendations and suggestions is come to the comments. So just do stay tuned and do watch out because we will be coming to your comments and questions in a sec. So one of the first things I would say, like my top tip is for parents to validate the child's concerns. So if your child, for instance, one of mine said to me last night, I just thought I'd let you know, I've been thinking about the return to school and my excitement is really big, but I I have a feeling that my anxiety is bigger. And I think there's a little bit of disgust in there. This is all coming from, of course, inside out. Inside inside out, too. (laughs) And so we went through it and actually anxiety, you know, we, we unpicked her anxiety, which I won't go into because it's very personal, but uh, we unpicked her anxiety. We unpicked the excitement because actually, you know, like I said, we talk about things being big emotions rather than negative and positive emotions. And again, if you haven't watched Inside Out 2, please do watch it. I've done a review of it over, over on my Instagram. Absolutely fantastic film. But validate your child's concerns. So the conversation between me and one of mine last night was very much, okay, that's brilliant that you've been able to unpick it that far by yourself. Let's have a chat about that. So when she started to talk about the things that made her excited, I was like, oh, I would be excited about that too. How brilliant. And then when she went on to say about the things that made her anxious, I said, Oh, I can remember feeling like that. Or, you know, if you don't remember, I'm not asking you to lie, um, but you could say, oh, my goodness, yes, I can imagine feeling like that. So you're placing that validation, removing the shame from the child's concerns. But also, you know, I could talk all day about this, by the way. And if you want to learn more about that, we've got tons on our Sunshine Academy that will be able to help you. But also, Kelly, it also extends from the teacher to the parent, doesn't it? Oh, 100 percent. And I always say to teachers, imagine it's your best friend coming to tell you about how concerned they are about your child. Would you talk to them differently to a parent coming into you as a professional? Of course you would. You wouldn't like talk in slang or anything like that. But the fundamental sort of message needs to be the same. It needs to be empathy, understanding, validation. You yeah. wouldn't turn around to your friend and go, well, that's nonsense. They're fine. We're, we're, they're fine in school. Just get them in. It doesn't matter that they're crying. Just bring them in through the door. Just leave. They'll be all right. You know, you just wouldn't say that to your friend. You say, gosh, that is awful. You must feel terrible leaving your child. Yeah. Why don't you have a chat to the teacher a little bit about how you can make that transition less distressing for everybody? That's what you'd say. Yeah. Why are teachers saying the same thing? But it's interesting you talk about validation of emotions as well and 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 sitting with your emotion and saying, hey, that's okay that you feel like that. I also felt like that. I also feel like that. One of the things that um, the MPs are coming out with, and I can't remember which MP said it, but they, it, it popped up yesterday, but they were talking about resilience and we need to make our children more resilient. You don't make a child more resilient just by kicking them up the bum and pushing them through a door. That is not resilient. Yeah, that's not resilient. That is that is Mm. the opposite of resilience. You are teaching them to squash and mask emotions. What resilience actually is, is recognizing and naming those emotions, sitting with them, being okay with them, and then thinking, okay, this is how I feel and that's all right. Does this need to stop me from doing things if it does then how can I get the help to sort of unpick that if it doesn't need to stop me from doing things then great I can go into this place and I can still have those big emotions but I'll be supported by the staff and that and that's where the staff need to mirror that that exactly what you described yeah be sharing those approaches then that child will feel safe at home and they will feel safe at school if they get a different experience no wonder children don't feel safe it's like you know what to expect they did like at home validated at school oh no you're fine you're fine you're fine get up there's no problem that is a different experience for a child 
And I think one, you know, not that I'm going to talk too much about trauma because you know what I'm like. I will go off on a tangent. But one of the biggest damaging things that happens to to people that that causes the sort of trauma bruise on their um, nervous system is shame. And people feel shame when they don't feel understood. They feel shame when they feel weird. They feel shame when they think what they're going through is different to everybody else and nobody understands them. So actually approaching a, pro um, a problem with validation removes the shame. And when you don't have shame, you become resilient because actually that experience is positive. Therefore, you go on to the next experience with that positive uh, mindset. So it's really, really important because the shame and the invalidation, if you like, actually creates nervous, anxious worriers. And that's what we're being faced with at the moment. Um, and I think it's interesting as well. And I've, I've got a reel that goes out later today all about the mental health system and the fact that this is, a you know, the pressure that you were just talking about, you know, oh, yeah, I'll just pull them in, close the door. I'll ring you later if there's a problem. They'll be fine when they're in. Just look, let's. This, this sounds a bit silly, this does. It sounds really silly. Let's just get them in. We need the numbers. That's really damaging to mental health because it brings about shame. It brings about trauma, anxiety and everything else. And it really creates barriers because who would want to go back there if that's what happens on day one? Um, and so I think that shit, we need to focus on that shame and meeting people where they are, like you said, you know, understanding, you know, let's just get our backs down. Let's get our shoulders down. Um and make sure that we're approaching things with an open mind. Um, I think one of the other things as well that's helped me with one of my kids, um, and actually Lindsay, our um, head teacher here, uh, another educator in our team who's running our Senko network, Lindsay was actually the amazing head teacher that helped me with this particular child of mine. And um, I collect head teachers, that's what my husband says. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I'm hoping like this. <laughs> they're all the best ones um but what she also said um to me at the time it, so it was reception and my daughter we didn't know at the time but she's got dld and she would really struggle she was actually fine genuinely fine when she got in the classroom but she found it very difficult going over that uh threshold mm. so we in fact it was my uh, mother-in-law as well who is also a specialist educator um she said to me and we spoke to Lindsay at the time why don't we use a transition object? So at the time, this particular child of mine was into farm animals. And so every day we bought her a farm animal set and every day she took a different farm animal in with a story. So she had something to say. So she was quite excited to tell her teacher. And we really, over the, the sort of first two terms probably of reception really helped her with this trans transition object. But it can be anything, can't it? A transition object. Yeah. Yeah, um, we because we in our school we had lots of children coming in taxis from various places, and transitional the, the transitional objects were so important because not only did they have to get out of their house, but then into a taxi, and then out of a taxi, and then across the the threshold of the school. And we used to, you know, do things that a lot of schools would be absolutely horrified about. Like for example, if a child came out of the taxi playing their um, Switch, Nintendo Switch or DS or something. Um, we would not very, it was a conscious choice. We would not just go, right, put that away. Now you're at school because mm -hmm. to a child, things like gaming is really important. And adults often don't understand that you need to get to a save point or a checkpoint or something like that within the game. Otherwise you lose the progress you've made since the last one. If the moment you get out of your taxi, someone's barking at you to put your DS in the bag, that's going to set you up straight away with a bad day. Because yeah. you're like, this person doesn't get me. They don't get what's important to me. I'm really engrossed in this game and someone's trying to talk to me. And then they're telling me I'm rude because I'm not listening to them and I'm not giving them eye contact. You know, you know, all these things. Yeah. So we used to be really patient and they get out of the taxi and they'd be playing and we'd just be like, OK. And then when they were finished, they knew because we, we did lots of social stories and help. You knew to, that you could put that thing in your bag, you could put it in your locker. And then that, that became like it was very unconventional transitional object. Yeah really important yeah, stuff because it's stories, transcended. You know, all of that sort of thing exactly and it felt respected that is exactly yeah. it what we have to again educators we have to put ourselves not in the shoes of children because we don't want to get all like down with the kids or anything because that's really embarrassing but we do have to acknowledge that you know what is important to children is yeah. of equal importance yeah absolutely and i think as well you know with transition object um 
we did a bit of work with um, a mainstream school, not that they really need our help because they're absolutely amazing, but they opened their doors to us so we could see what good practice looked like. Um, and one of the things that they did was they created a breakfast club. And I talk about this all the time because I absolutely blooming loved it. This school, by the way, didn't have school attendance difficulties and their attendance levels were very high. Shock horror. Um, what they did was they got these parents together and said, look, we want this to be a community thing. OK, we want you to feel like you're part of a community. By the way, that is vital in school attendance. Yeah. Um, and what they did was they said they wanted to put on a breakfast club. Um, for a number of reasons. Some children don't get breakfast. We know that. OK. Um, number two, some parents feel quite alienated. Kids feel alienated. School attendance might be a problem or whatever. So they put this school breakfast club on for the parents to attend with the children. So it wasn't just a, a, a child care thing. It wasn't somewhere where you drop your kids off and go to work. This was where you come and you sit for your breakfast as an adult with your kids. And it's a transition room. I mean, they didn't call it that, of course, but essentially that's what we're talking about here. It's a transition space. And what they saw was that children just softly removed themselves from their parents and into their peer groups. So there was no ripping off of a plaster, so to speak. It was very gen uh, gradually done, very oh, gradually gosh. done. And they said, look, the only thing we're going to ever struggle with is the funding for it, because everybody's on board. Teachers are on board. Parents are on board. So the parents just put into a little pot if they can. And then with that money, they buy bagels. And then when I was there, they were looking for chocolate crepes, you know, because it was pancake day. Um, and you sort of think that one thing alone, I'm sure, I mean, there's loads of other stuff they do because they've got forest schools on site and all sorts. This is a magnificent mainstream school. But that alone, you've got parents engaging with one another, socialising. You've got parents engaging and believing in the school. You've got this connectivity, this connection, this beautiful relationship development. How gorgeous. And then the, the, the kids don't feel like they're being dropped off. They feel like they've gone to coffee club, like with mum and dad or whatever. And then they just softly got into their classes. It's just, it was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So there are those sort of transition we need to be looking at that transition, whether it's a transition object, you can do a mixture, it depends on the children. But, um, and another thing is, I want to talk a bit about familiar routines because Kelly, you are, I admire you, I've said it before, your bedtime routines with your kids are how you've created healthy sleep patterns for your kids. So you know, you, you've always been the I, same. I like <laughs> sleep, all right, I like sleep. And I <laughs> a lot of work in the evenings and I need like regulation time of my own therefore my children's sleep patterns have become incredibly important to me yeah absolutely but what I'm saying is you've created these lovely routines where your kids know what co what comes next you know they're well, only they living if I forget stuff there we go and I think that actually the the routine in the morning the routine between uh, uh the evening before school is really really important and I know as an ADHD -er, I really struggle with routines because I I get almost quite demand avoidant about it um but I think those routines are I mean we know that when we're looking at trauma recovery routine and um rhythm and resonance are all crucial to developing trust and developing relationships and developing safe and sound connections um but there's stuff that people can do, isn't it? That, that you know, that the routines are very, very important. I mean, like I said, they've yeah. benefited your family enormously. Yeah, and I think connection is the main part of the routine, because at every stage in the routine, there. I'm just thinking, my my kids, you know, who knows if they are neurodivergent or not? They're three and two, like you know, we we don't know. Um, but they do thrive on knowing what comes next and they thrive on that connection. So every stage in our evening routine is all about connection. And my older child, when she changed classes at nursery, really struggled with that change because mm. the her, her previous class was incredibly like cuddly and nurturing. And then she went into a class where the teacher, I don't like the teacher. Um, <laughs> I never thought I'd be that teacher parent. Uh oh, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but she's just really cold so I'm I, I feel like asking her sometimes like why do you do this job you clearly don't like children <laughs> like, why are you here um 
she's got a child at in the same class so that's clearly why she does the job because she's easy but anyway she's just very cold and doesn't do very much cuddling and doesn't do that whole connection and and my my oldest child is incredibly emotionally literate and also got a really good vocabulary so she's able to talk about and reason in a way that her classmates aren't always able to do um and where she gets that from kelly and and therefore she doesn't really get it when she is talked to in a way that this lady talks to the other children because she's like that is not like i can talk about how i'm feeling if you ask me the right questions and i can't like if you don't ask me the right questions i can't so she had an awful time and she started doing the whole screaming kicking i don't want to go in sort of thing and i was thinking oh gosh here we go like this is what i do for a living and now i have to sort of do it myself when it's your own kids as well you, you lose all sense of being able to sort it out like it just disappears out of your brain like what what is that about anyway um I refuse. Like when when this lady was just like, right, you just need to leave her. I'm like, no, no, I've been here, done that. Like, this is what I do for a job. We're not doing that. This is what we're going to do instead. And I gave the nursery a whole like series of about five or ten different scripts. And I was like, just use these scripts, and then we will see where we go. And all the scripts and all the routines that I gave them were all about connection. So it was about don't talk to her standing up, sit yeah. down. These are all like basic things. Why am I telling the nursery how to do this? But the, here's where we were. So I was like, right, sit down, connection, physical connection, hold both her hands and say, hey, it's okay. And just look in her eyes and don't say anything. And then she'll feel grounded and she'll feel there and everything's okay. And surprise, surprise, it worked. And this is all yeah. part of the routines that we do in the evening as well. So it's all about like we've got magnesium cream um, because that's quite good for kids. And, and they get a little foot massage every night. Yeah. And my youngest who literally turned two last week he now gets him he, he gets himself into his own sleeping bag so he goes bag and puts it on um when he's <laughs> after he's had his bath and he does his zip he fiddles with the zip and I, I start it off and then he does the rest because he's in that era where he has to do everything himself yeah. and then he sticks his feet at the bottom of the bag and goes mama feet <laughs> like okay and then as I rub his feet we talk about what we've done in the day and of course he just chats nonsense because he's two but I'm like and remember when we did this and, and I really liked when you did this and thank you for putting those toys with me and there I am rubbing his feet at the same time he's chuckling away he's loving his foot rub and and, it, and it's the same every single night we talk about what we've done in the day we talk about what's coming the next day we talk about what they're worried about about the next day um literally my three-year-old every single time put her in bed and she goes where am I going after this nap she calls all sleeps naps where am I going after this nap and I'm like right okay we're doing this this and this and it's all every single night it's the same every it's single night it's the same. yeah it's so important and I think um sort of going on from that knowing what they're doing in their day so sometimes particularly when they're in you know school you can you've got a little diary and you know what what they're doing in their day or stuff may have been shared on dojo or whatever um, and it's that sort of, as you're sending them in, have fun doing that. Oh, you're going to be doing that today. Have fun. And one of the things I always do as well is say, I'll see you at this tree when you come out. Because my girls are at an age now where they walk out of the gate on their own and they meet me just outside. And I'll say, I'll see you at this tree or I'll see you at that bench or whatever. And it's that creating. I know my mum will be there. And it's, you know, if they're having a difficult time, they'll know. Oh, don't worry. It's not long. And my mum will be at the tree, you know, and it is that that developing a relationship, that trust. And also, you know, if you've got a child who's diff having difficulty with attending school, share this information with the school. Mm -hmm. um, it's something I did recently where um, one of my girls um, who's got an EHCP, I, I feel like I've got 500 kids. Uh, one of my girls who's got an EHCP, she um, there's certain things in the week that she struggles with. But I think sometimes she mugs the teachers off. <laughs> So I'm like, well, she doesn't struggle with that at home. So let's put something in place. So I said to them, this is how we incentivize her at home because she loves incentives. She Not all children like incentives, but she is somebody that if she develops the incentives with us and then she aims for it. <clears throat> and so with her actual school, um, if it's anything, anything, you know, that, that they're trying to encourage her to do, I said, incentivize her, make it interesting. She really is driven by this um, and it does work. But that building the relationship, of course, is not just between the adult and the child, but the school and the parent as well. So it's quite nice when we get to share these ideas and you know, OK, 
schools don't have enough time to be able to do this for all 30 kids in the class, but some kids will find it more difficult than others. So let's focus on those ones because by getting it right for those ones, you're getting it right for all of them anyway, aren't you? Absolutely. Um, Gosh, and then, another thing, uh, I'm just I will come to them in just a second. I've got two more things um, that I want to say. Um, don't be afraid to write on their ch on your children's hands. I don't know. I've done this with mine where I oh, draw a heart. heart. Yeah. yeah, and then you squeeze them and it's a little cuddle. And yeah. you can have pocket hugs. So there's like, I bought mine a little sort of, um, oh, what do they call it? That uh, resin stuff. Um, It's a little heart and they just squeeze it in their pocket. They put, just put it in their pocket and squeeze it and they go, you know, that's a pocket hug from my mum. Um, Sadly, one of my girls had hers confiscated and I was really furious. Because just about to say, some schools would be like, you're not fiddling with that. I'm going to take that mm -hmm. away. But it's in the pocket. So can we just like, you know, that's not one I'm going to back down on. It's just in their pocket. Have an agreement with the child. Keep it in your pocket and you can have your pocket hug. That's what it's called, pocket hug. Um, and of course, if your child is really struggling, it's good to encourage. We don't we want to develop that res resilience, but that comes from validating their concerns. But encourage them. Um, but don't force it. They, If today is not going to happen, it's not going to happen. And that's OK. And I know that it can throw a spanner in the works, particularly for working parents. But um, anyway, OK, let's come to some questions. OK, there are loads. I'm going to just pick some out. I noticed somebody has said there is a new FII pandemic in schools. Sadly, it's not new. That's why we exist. <laughs> I got accused, wrongly accused of FII. That's fabricating or inducing a child's illness. Um um, which is different to Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Um, I got accused of that back in 2016 um, because I demanded help for my child. And uh, it was absolute hell. I'm not going to go into details now. There's loads of information about my experience if you want to have a look at it. But also do check out FII Awareness Week because Sunshine Support, our organisation, we founded FII Awareness Week several years ago. So we've got tons and tons and tons of resources. We know all about the latest research. So if you need any help, give us a shout. Belinda says, a child with trauma, anxiety, waiting for autism assessment, maybe PDA, heavy masking, caused not to be able to go to school for almost two years, tried a small specialist school, didn't work, don't know what else to do. What do you think, Ke Kelly? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I mean, on just on the very, very face of it and applying the black and white sort of law processes about you know what goes next if no school or college is appropriate for your child and you can show that through you know you know evidence um there is a pathway called the otis which is education otherwise than in school different to elective home education now i've done a whole great big webinar about this that's on the sunshine academy um, about how it's different to electively home educating your child and if you've already had a small specialist school placement you're going to have an EHCP and there's going to be a level of funding attached to your EHCP so looking at education otherwise might be an option for you mm -hmm. because um, lots of people think of it as being like a homeschool type thing where your child just has tutors that come to the house and they never leave the house and you can never go to work it doesn't have to be like that good EOTAS packages involve adults who can build relationships with your child where, meet them where they are in a safe space and then they can get going in the community dipping in and out of different groups doing you know travel training on public transport doing budgeting going out and shopping all of these things that your child will need to be explicitly taught to them um mm. can be covered so have a look at that webinar i would um, and just see if the Otis is for you. If you think it's not for you, then I would definitely encourage looking at other schools because one small specialist school is not another. And in my school, we had a lot of pupils who had multiple failed placements in different places, including other special schools. Yeah. And the way that we did things was very, very different. And it suited children immensely well. Like we had kids who'd been out of school for 18 months um, who'd not left their bedroom for a year and they managed to come to us. It took a lot of work and it took a lot of time and nothing was easy or quick. But I would keep exploring schools if Yotas isn't the path the pathway that you think you need. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was one of my children ended up at your school after a long, long time out of school, long, long time out of their bed, not being able to come out of their bedroom. So yeah. it can work. Um, Rebecca says, I can't afford to pay the fines, but also won't put my child in a position of self-harm and, and harm just for us to get somewhere she's physically, mentally hates. Uh, she would rather die than go to. Don't send her. 
you don't have to send her um do speak to us though because it's it, i think a lot of parents like you just said think that it's either going to a mainstream school or going to a school or home ed it doesn't have to be that way um we've got tons of information on this it, i always feel we want to share more but we've already recorded it for you so rather than go over old um ground we've got nearly 200 in fact over 200 now uh courses on all of these things on our Sunshine Academy. So be sure to have a look at it. Um, have you contacted the new Secretary of Education at all? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not sure that she would want to, yeah, yet. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure she'd want to hear from us, but I have put a call out for her to get in touch with us, but it's really hard. I don't think they want to listen half the time. Mm. Um, let's have a look. Uh, Carol says, my son was at a special educational school for kids with autism, decided they couldn't meet his needs. He's not been to school since March. Still no school. He's 14, 15 in October. So it's, you know, crucial times, really, GCSE times. Um, get in touch, though, Carol. We'll help you because we've got a long list of schools that we've, we've already tried and tested amongst the team. We've got nine full time advocates here at Sunshine Support. And so they work mental crazy busy bonkers hours and also they dealt with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases just like yours so the chances are we know what to suggest so get in touch because we can absolutely help you um double-edged sword safety valve scheme in la has forced mainstream schools to take more children with sen we're doing this at derby at the moment they're saying we're placing more funding into sen but it's actually mainly in mainstreams um, but children with SEND needs, they need special educational settings. Absolutely. Mainstream schools are not inclusive. So SEND children and families will suffer again and again, even if they want to be inclusive. You know, if you think about my, one of my kids goes to a, a mainstream secondary that suits her beautifully. There are 2000 kids in there. That's mm -hmm. not right for a lot of kids who are struggling with sensory or communication difficulties or, you know, there's so many kids that don't fit into that box. And I think that's the ones we need to be focusing on here. Um, and it, I was asked actually by the BBC last year, why do you want to segregate segregate special needs kids from mainstream kids? I said, it's not that. It's about representation. You know, if you if you go into somewhere and you feel like, say, for instance, you went to school. I went to school and everybody there was male and I was the only female. Would I feel comfortable? Nothing to do with gender. I'm talking about the fact that they don't have something in common with me. I'm not represented in that school. I don't have a cohort. I don't have a peer group. So actually, it's really important that autistic kids get to play with autistic kids. Because guess what? They have a very similar, they're all different, of course, but they got a similar vibe. They, You can see them gravitate towards each other. My kids had a birthday party on the weekend and I noticed or the autistic kids that didn't even know each other actually all gravitated towards each other and started talking about coding. And I was like, this is amazing. This is like my life. I'm putting my, I'm practicing what I preach. Um, we always talk about finding a tribe, don't we? Yeah. That, you know, that's the case for children and parents. You've got to feel, and you, you have to feel like, you you know, you, you can look around and recognize people. And that actually goes the other way too, because not all special schools are the answer to no. children with autism because often and I, and I again I don't mean to cast any aspersions on local authority maintained special schools but generally there are a lot less specialists than say independent specialist schools and then you get a really broad range of send and sometimes pupils who are autistic don't feel like they belong there either no. because they look around and they think you know people aren't like me here no. so whenever we're talking about schools with parents I always say don't worry about a label don't worry about whether it's specialist or this or that or independent or maintained or whatever. You've just got to find somewhere your child feels at home. And as long as that, that that's front and center with everything and it, even even Ofsted ratings, I'm often like to people, don't worry about them unless there's nothing really crackers in terms of safeguarding in that yep. Ofsted report. Even if something requires improvement, is it right for your child? Because I've had so many kids in outstanding schools judged by Ofsted that you know they fail the children and the children don't like they can't cope um, so so none of that none of those labels matter it's about does this school feel like it's home for my child does this school make me feel whenever they call me and I see that number appear on the phone mm -hmm. does it make me feel like I'm going to have a panic attack yeah. or does it make me smile yeah yeah one. 
And I think as well, for those who are looking for provisions, we've got a free downloadable checklist on our website. You can just download it, print it off, and then take it in with you. And I did this with a, with a family when I was testing out the checklist many, many years ago. And we went into, the, the local authority had said to them, we want to put your child into this uh, maintained autistic school. And the parents said, well, actually, we would prefer this independent autistic school. So we did a, a visit and I went along with them and we went into the independent school and we said, talk to us about speech and language. And they were like, oh, we've got a team of five speech and language therapists. They're on tap because we fully appreciate that kids are not always ready to attend an appointment. So it's embedded in our curriculum. They said all the right things, very similar to, to the school that you used to be at Kelly. Speech and language is embedded. OT was embedded. Every specialist provision was embedded. Then we went into the maintained one, the, the council-led autism school, and we said, okay, talk to us about speech and language. And they were like, um, I don't, what do you mean? And we said, well, do you have a speech and language therapist? No. What? We're not a therapy suite. No, but you're set. So what sets you apart? What? They didn't have a clue about OT. We said, what sets you apart from others in this field? And they said, oh, well, the class sizes go up to 15. So it was a small, in the, it was a small mainstream school, essentially, where they said, oh, we've just got bad behavior here. And I'm like, oh, God. So actually, it was really, really frustrating. Um, I'll come to one more question, and then we're going to have to dash. I'm really sorry. I think we've got an Ask Me Anything uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, haven't we? Um, I don't, is it Nicole that's doing it? We've got an app. I put me on a spot. No, I should know. One of this. our sunshine elves in the comments will write. It will. Yes. We'll put a link in. So I must say we have um, a face to face uh, event that happens every single month where only twenty people can get in a room, and they it's an online event, and you get to sit with one of our advocates for a whole hour and ask them questions. And because we limit the numbers, it means that actually they're only going in there to answer your questions, and there's only twenty of you that are able to ask a question. So if you'd like to come along to one of those, just comment, and we'll send you the link. Um, Oh, this is a really good one. I wish I could do that, but my daughter is nonverbal, so we can't unpick in a specific way. So I think this is another thing that there are other ways to communicate. And this is where speech and language therapy is vital because mm -hmm. Libby Hill, I mean, she trains us all in, in sort of all of this, but there are so many ways other than verbal that we can look at anxiety and understand what's going on. But also... Schools need to be mindful of that. Just because a child isn't talking doesn't mean they can't and doesn't mean they don't understand what's going on around them. They absolutely. In fact, quite often when one of our senses is almost muted, the other one's heightened. So actually they're very aware of their surroundings. So there's so much. I hope I can see there's quite a lot of questions. However, I think we've actually answered them in our conversation. Um mm. But by all means, if you need us, we now have no waiting list for our advocates. Yay! We've been working so hard on this, haven't we? Oh, yes, we have. We hate keeping people waiting because often okay. things have deadlines, don't they? Often things do with yeah. the local authority. They have deadlines. We can't talk to you. The deadline passes. Yeah. Rubbish. We hate operating like that. We are so glad at the moment now, if you sign up for advocacy, you will get assigned basically within a day. Um, so if you get a draft check, for example, if your EHC comes in, draft plan, and you have 15 days to get back to your LA, if you get back to us on the day or day after you get it, we can do that draft check for you at the moment. There's no no problem with it. So um, do, do, do that if you need that. Because, gosh, I've got an EHC webinar coming up, actually. All the ins and outs of an EHCP. It's coming up on the 17th of September. Um, and um, definitely check that out because we are finding that there's lots of strange little myths about wording and about private reports and about provision. And um, if, if thinking about the beginning of the school year, you're thinking, oh, I don't really know whether to go for an EHCP. I don't know if we have the right support level. Um, come along to that webinar. But also if you've got an EHCP or you're in you're in that you're in a phase transfer. So you're going to have your annual review in this term um get in touch as well because yeah. there's prep to do there thinking about well, transition and, things. and equally if you do have your annual review and you get a post review draft plan and you need us to check whether it's any good that's another really good yes. thing to get in touch about 
So I'll just complete uh, recap a few things for you in terms of our upcoming events so that you know where to get support. We've got an in-person cuppa and chat this Friday at our Sunshine Hub. So if you are in the East Midlands, come and pay us a visit. It's free to attend. We have lots of lovely snacks and lots of hot drinks and cold drinks. So do come along to that. Um, we've also got on Thursday this week, we've got the PDA profile, understanding the PDA profile with okay. Phil Christie. And he is absolute PDA royalty because he was one of the students of Elizabeth Newson, who, of course, discovered PDA. So Phil is incredible. He used to be a head teacher as well. Um, he's phenomenal. So if you want to come along to that, that's Thursday evening. We've also next week, we're heading uh, sort of head first into a problem that's happening a lot. And we've discussed why. And that's suicidal thoughts in autistic people. Um, we're going to be going through that with Dr. Rachel Mosley, who is incredible. She's so gentle. She's brilliant at helping us to understand. She puts herself in a really vulnerable position in order to help others to learn. So that's a really, really fantastic webinar. Um, and then the week after, of course, it's your webinar on the ultimate guide to um, applying for an EHC and that's an online one but in yep. october of course you've got your full day event as well where you're going to be helping people to actually write their application so it's okay. not just a case of teaching them but we're going to be sitting there getting the process started as well it's great i love them i basically go into teach mode again because everyone's in the room they've got their laptops out they've got all their evidence and their highlighters and they're like this is jarvis <laughs> <laughs> um, love it uh there's actually people i've seen some names in the chat who've actually come to one of those ehc oh. games. If you're still in here and you're listening just pop how you found that day because if anyone's on the fence about coming it really helps to hear from yes. people who've been to them because Absolutely. it's a bit daunting isn't it about walking into a room with people you don't know and stuff but we always try and make it so welcoming. You get a little goodie bag as well, um, refreshments. Oh, really and we've got new place. merch. We've got new merch. I, yeah. I have got a coffee cup as well, and it's in the it, it's being washed. But we've got new merch. We've got yo-yos. My kids have gone mad. I'm going to have to post a picture of these. But people will get them. Comes around, right? Like yo-yos were a thing when I was a kid. Everyone would do like tricks and stuff, and now they're back. Brilliant. Yeah, I love it. Brilliant. But keep your, your uh, questions coming because the team will manage the questions. Um, and by all means, if you need us, ping us a message. We will help you. Do not suffer in silence. Um, this time of year is so difficult. You're doing a grand job. You are doing a grand job. So just take a breather, have a coffee and make sure you're looking after yourselves because self-care is number one. It's not selfish. It's really unselfish, actually. So make sure you're looking after yourselves. But we're here if you need us. Give us a shout. Kelly, I will see you shortly, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a lovely day. Bye. Bye.